My mouth of wisdom comes out. It's just amazing. And everything I say is gold. I think that helps me. Um, you know, let's be real. So um, I guess that depends who you ask. Um, there are some people who will absolutely say that does not help us. We need our person to look just like a regular politician. And, you know, I think there are times in history where you would have, maybe even I would have agreed with them, right? Um, during the time of broadcast media when um, it was very, um, they picked who they put on the TV and you sat in your little living room and you watched that you ate your TV dinner and you watched who they told you and everything looked the same and it was all sanitized and controlled and the neoliberals had everything down and under control and nobody knew any different right um, but the internet came along and changed everything it's not like that anymore working class people discovered that there were other working class people out there who were also aware that had the sense that something wasn't quite right and the way media operates now and the way the world operates now is that people are starting to look around for things that are different they're starting to notice that the people in the suits they're no longer associating that with actually um you know prestige um they're actually starting to associate that with abuse and control and domination and warfare and exploitation so uh under those circumstances i think presenting something different something that looks more like a working class person and less like the people that are exploiting them is a really valuable thing. And we do need a second chance to make a new impression with the American public because a lot of them have given us that first look and decided they didn't like what they saw. So um, when you reach that point, you kind of do have to do something different to get their attention for a second shot. So. <laughs> okay, this, you're going to laugh at this, but I have this fantasy of getting on the Ellen show and then like completely humanizing my story as a survivor of addiction and homelessness. Um, mainstream, I don't want to just mainstream liberals, right? You know, they eat that stuff up. And the cool thing about me is that like, I don't have to fake it. Like I'm actually authentic. I'm down to earth. Um, it's kind of funny. I always tell people, you know, I'm the most type A free spirit you'll ever meet. Like I, you know, I come from the street. I come from, you know, oppression and suffering and like overcoming it, but I'm also a success story. And I'm, I'm really good at articulating my experiences with authoritarian structures and the way that it made my life worse while it was pretending to try to make my life better. Um, I'm really good at putting that, like at humanizing it, but also like using precise language to drive it home. So. I dare Ellen to bring me on her show and not come out of that show converted into a libertarian, an anarchist maybe even. So, The easiest way I can put it is to stop trusting authority and start believing in yourself and each other. So I feel like one of the things that has gone sort of un how do i put this people don't realize how often they just do stuff without um relying on a, an authority figure to tell them what to do first um this happens all the time and it's as simple as like five of us are going out to eat and we're selecting a, you know at which diner to go to so you know we we figure that out we make a decision together and then we go boom that was anarchy right um one of you says, hey, I didn't get paid yet. And so, oh, don't worry, I, I got your dinner tonight. You know, come on, come out with us. That's anarchy. That is just people taking care of themselves and trusting one another to make um, decisions that are best. Negotiating through what happens if someone doesn't like Chinese food or someone um, like, you know, already had Mexican food for lunch or whatever it is, you negotiate through those things and you figure it out together and boom, you go to dinner and everyone has fun. That's anarchy and we can just, we can don't get me wrong if we were actually following the constitution i wouldn't cry about it but at the same time you know this is like 300 year old technology so it's okay for humanity to like evolve past it and find new less violent ways of doing things so that's what anarchy means to me
So picture what's going to happen after Ellen falls in love with me and then Donald Trump starts imitating me. You know how I, you probably noticed I was waving my hands around when I talk like I do that. I just do that. I have I have a gay accent, whatever you want to call it. You know, I wave my hands around. I, I just I get excited. Right. And so that comes across in a human way to like ordinary people. But for Donald Trump, like it's going to get under his skin. He's going to start doing this in interviews, making fun of me. And it's going to be fabulous. And I can't wait for you to join me on that journey. <laughs> so <laughs> as I welcome that. Like, it, like when I when I fast forward to the future and I imagine myself being chair because, you know, I did have to do that to talk myself into it before I could talk you all into it. Um, so in my imagination, I'm seeing all these things happen. And like what you just described is like part of what makes it a victory for me. Like when I talked about talk to myself, excuse me, when I think to myself about whether. Um, running this race is worth my time and whether um, I can honestly present myself to you as your chairperson, um, that's part of what I imagine is that they're going to be like, what the heck did those people just do? Why did they do that? And that sort of, you know, hailstorm that you talk about, um, every single one of those sort of questions like, how can you chair a major party when you were, you know, just homeless, like, you know, 10 years ago? Um, those are great chances to talk about the role of uh, the policing um, power in um, sort of sweeping people away and trying to erase them rather than actually solving their problems. You're telling me that government is here to protect us and to keep us safe, but like I have this one particular story. So this one particular morning I was sleeping in a public park and um, I woke up and my bag was gone, literally everything I own. And there was a cop in my face. And I go, where's my stuff? And the cop was like, that's not my problem. Why are you in this park? And I remember thinking to myself, wait, aren't you here to protect? Like I knew that they weren't already because I was already a libertarian, like I knew. But I remember thinking to myself, I got to remember that this story happened because one of these days when I'm chair of the party, um, I can tell this on national TV as a, a powerful, like sort of, you know, pushback to the idea that government's there to protect me. The government did not protect me that day. 100% of everything I owned was gone. Like, I have to go beg for money to replace my deodorant. I have to go beg for money to get $2 for my, you know, my breakfast at Jack in the Box. And if you, you're saying that you're there to protect my property, and I tell you that my property is gone, and you tell me that's not your problem, you've just told me everything I need to know about government in like three words. That's not my problem, four words. That's not my problem. Perfect. That's not my problem. Four words. That's all you need to know about government. That's not my problem is what they really think of you. What they really actually think of anybody who doesn't have like a huge amount of money and power already in the system. That's what they think of you. So. I really think that sort of human response to questions where I actually use my personal history is going to be a real strength there. And it really comes full circle back to my point about us making a new, um, a new impression on the public. Um, because one of the errors about us that are out there is that we hate poor people, um, that we're racist, that we're bigots, that we, um, that we don't care about, um, you know, gay people gender and sexual minorities. Um, the, this idea that um, it's all about property rights and how we somehow own transgender people's genitals because entrepreneur, therefore property rights or whatever, you know, um, and bless our porcupine little hearts. Like I get the kernels of truth in like what everyone's been trying to say. Um, but what that adds up to is like a really false impression of us. That's just not true. We aren't actually like that. We're really loving, really compassionate. Um, people that we really want to, the, the reason why we want to live in a world that is non-coercive is precisely because we care so deeply for the well-being of the individual. Um, but getting a, good luck getting a second chance to say that, um, unless you do something really outrageous like elect a man with a mohawk who waves his hands around it with jazz hands and is willing to tell super personal stories about the time that, you know, they had to... 
sorry. There's people walking through the lobby. No worries. No worries. <laughs> okay. So I think one of the sort of equalizing powers of the internet has been that it allows ordinary people like me, I'll be a little less ordinary, but still I'm going to be the chair of the third largest party. So it's a distant third in terms of size, you know, they're going to try to ignore us. Um, but if anybody has been watching my work in the Libertarian Party, um, I was doing incredible things while I was still in transitional housing. Like the minute I got out of my relapse and into recovery, I, I was in my transitional You guys didn't know, but I was on the internet on one of those little 3G like cards. You know, those little like prepaid, like you stick it into your USB and that's your internet connection. That's what I was doing some of that early work on, like the Freedom Torch Parade um, that was for Chelsea Manning at the time where we had motorcyclists do an actual like cross-country trip. I organized that from transitional housing. So my point being, uh, people like Alexandra AOC, she has shown us the power of, you know, strategically timed tweets, um, you know, pointed insightful tweets at the right person at the right time. Um, so my goal is to kind of, you know, the LP does have, you know, we can get interviews and we can utilize that um, sort of second first impression thing that I'm talking about where I humanize myself and I'm hoping my hope I can't promise this to you because I'm not an authoritarian I'm not going to wave my magic wand although I will wave a magic wand and hopefully things happen right but like you know where it lands nobody knows all I can say is that between the internet and traditional media and having them go wait what's really going on here I think there's something cool there and once they like actually realize um, they're going to be as captivated by it as they would be with AOC, just like she is. Her entire thing is that they can't stop looking at her because she's a bartender who's in Congress now. Okay, I'm a homeless guy who's now chairing a major political party in the largest nation on earth. Well, uh, first of all, it would be great if people would stop trying to die on Age of Consent Hill um, because it's just a losing conversation. Um, but the sort of what's important to kind of recognize about the reason why it's important to stand for youth autonomy isn't so that, you know, 12 year olds can take advantage of the gray area to like, you know, do weird things with their 18 year old, you know, boyfriend. It's because 12 year old transgender youth have the right to uh, negotiate with their parents and their care provider about whether they want to be on puberty blockers so that they can make an informed consensual decision to transition when they are old enough, right? There is a period of time where a person is not yet ready to make fully informed consensual decisions about everything, um, but they are slowly discovering their autonomy like from the inside out. And that transitional like period of a person's youth is highly personal it's highly individual and the government shouldn't be making you know a one-size-fits-all decision um but the worst possible frame around that i can't nail this home enough is age of consent always pivot from age of consent as soon as you can to something else period and um i just feel like Arvin was an elected official, so I saw. I understand that he put Sarwark in a really weird position because this is a bottom-up party, and he wasn't elected by the chair. He was elected by you all, the same people who will elect me, and the same people to whom we are both accountable. So um, at a certain point, um, I just feel like, you know, when all you have left is your speech and the fact that people pay a little bit more attention to you than the other officers, um, the best you can do is try to use that platform and try to, you know, give people other things to talk about. Like for me, it's, it's, there's two actually, actually three, actually I'll tell a personal story. <laughs> so one of my first, first time, my parents made me go to church and I didn't like it because I was like analyzing what was being said to me and it didn't match up with like, it just, it didn't, it didn't match up for me. I started asking too many questions. I, my parents started punishing me. Um, and like I was trapped in my home with these parents who were like, it was just, it was bad and I was suffering. So I wrote to my congressperson. 
<laughs> no, I wrote to my state legislature because we were learning about it in my civics class. And um, they sent me back a form letter and I was really disappointed because like I was asking them, don't I have freedom of religion? Don't, don't I have a right to tell my parents, no, I will not go to church. Um, and they didn't give me a good answer. The answer is yes, I do have the right to decline church, but unfortunately we live in a society where according to the age of majority rules, I was still their property. So according to the law, they could in fact, and this is what they did, literally drag me out of bed, spank my butt if I said no, drag me to the car and make me go sit in church and get indoctrinated for several hours every Sunday. That's what actually happened. Um, and this comes back to, again, this is why youth autonomy and handling those conversations with care is actually really super important to protecting, uh, particularly teenagers, who really do have a right to begin exercising their freedom of conscience as it develops. So, you know, I guess that answer was too probably Arvin specific because there could be a lot of different ways that question would manifest. In the broader sense, um, I feel like the unity narrative, the bottom unity narrative overall has, I, I've had a lot of fun with it because it's a very expansive idea of what counts as a libertarian. So whereas we used to sort of try to police each other's thoughts and speech um, by like excluding, oh, well, that's not NAP, you know, that's not NAP compliant, so you don't belong. And um, there was a lot of like trying to push out every person every time they deviated. Um, and that was a very uncomfortable feeling. Now, don't get me wrong, there are some ideas that are just authoritarian. They don't belong in an anti-authoritarian space. They aren't bottom immunity compliant. But the cool thing about the bottom immunity like, way of thinking is that we're always looking for ways to like draw people in um, and include them. So um, my point with that is that it has expanded like what counts as the boundary around libertarianism and how they can fit into it even when not all of their speech um, matches the purest principle and my point with all that is that it, it has led to a situation where there are so many more different kinds of libertarians who are available to reach the person who's doing the cringy speech in the moment that they're doing it right so um, Arvin and I self identifies as an ANCAP so I'm not sure that me coming to him with all this nuance about transgender youth was going to resonate in that moment. But somebody like Adam Kokesh or maybe, um, I don't know, I can't think of another famous ANCAP, but there's tons of them in this party, so just insert your favorite one, would have a better chance, right? What is an ANCAP? Uh, an ANCAP is an anarcho-capitalist. So, um, essentially, it's basically the focus there is on private property. As a lot of times, it's the all rights are property. All, no, that's more of an Austrian, huh? There's a lot of overlap there. That's a, actually a, an interesting question. There's more than one kind of ANCAP we have found in the bottom unity era. There are, they range from paleo, sort of Austrian fundamentalists, I call them. Um, and those are the all rights or property rights people. So it's arguing from self-ownership, um, taking that like literally as the self as property and therefore everything the self does as an extension of that property right. Um, or another word for that is propertarianism. And then there's the, cos I call them the cosmopolitan an ANCAPs. So these are the ones that um, I don't want to assign the word left to them, but they're probably to the left of the other kind of ANCAPs, but only like one square. And um, they tend to be more favorable on transgender, or at least less cringy speech on uh, transgender rights, um, more staunchly open borders. Um, so libertarianism, libertarianism spans the spectrum, <laughs> spans a pretty broad spectrum. It does. And you can tell I really, I love the like differences between them. I, it really is a beautiful philosophy. Like I, I would love for our, the general public population to fall in love with these ideas the way the rest of us are. So.
Well, there are as many ways to be audacious as there are audacious caucus members or really libertarians. Um, there are people like Vermin Supreme who uh, uh, operate through performance art. Um, there are people like um, James Weeks who did a famous performance art piece at one of the national conventions. Um, there are people like Jeff Wood who's um, style of audacity is just uh, very outspoken and direct defiance. My style of audacity is kind of the way that I sneak. It's the way I, my mind sort of, I turn um, actually quite radical speech into making them sound very common sense and like almost humanist to relate to. Like, I don't know if you noticed, but I totally slipped transgender hormone puberty blockers into a thing about um, you know, age of consent, and I just, I made that sound like effortless. Like, I, sure, the audience was probably nodding along. Oh, that makes perfect sense. I, like, that's actually considered a super radical idea, and I just like slipped it in there like nothing. Um, another example just from this interview is um, when I told the story about sleeping in the public park. I'm pretty sure that when you were listening to that, you were like, wow, that like, something sunk in but like the idea of a, a society that stands for people who have to sleep in public parks is actually pretty radical too like homeless people do not have very many allies at all and I just even under the radar but just right through so like your radar doesn't even like you see it on the radar and you recognize it as an ally so that's my style and that's what I want to keep doing